Today's project is the 1998 Lincoln Town Car Engine Swap Part 2. This video is not intended to replace the factory service manual or other forms of technical information. My goal is to give you the additional information I needed that was not provided with the service manual, and to share tips and tricks that I used when I didn't have the tools called out in the manual. I purchased a 4.6 liter Ford engine from the salvage yard, but I got quite a surprise when I removed the shrink wrap. What I received for my $1,000 was a long block. A long block is a core engine with the heads installed. All the engine accessories you see in this photo have been removed by the salvage yard to allow them to be sold to another customer. It's much easier to change gaskets and accessories with the engine out of the vehicle, so this was the perfect time to do so. To start the long block rebuild process, actually required some teardown. I needed to remove the valve covers and the timing cover. The Ford 4.6 liter is an overhead cam engine. Notice the hemispherical provision in the valve covers for the timing chain and gears. It's important to put the studs in the correct location because clips are slipped over these studs later when the wiring harness is installed. The valve covers have been photographed from different angles to ensure the proper relocation of the studs. Some photos include a close-up, while others include a side-by-side -side comparison of the left and right valve cover. The valve cover hardware was returned to its original head location with the valve covers removed. This will prevent the hardware from being intermingled between the two engines. A photograph of the timing cover is necessary because it uses different bolts and studs of different lengths and thread sizes. To remove the timing chain cover, the first bolt we're going to remove is that of the harmonic balancer. A gear puller will be necessary to remove the harmonic balancer from the crankshaft. A cardboard template showing the bolt location is a very valuable tool during reinstallation. It can even be marked with the torque specifications and torque sequence for the different hardware. I had an old motor to use as my reference. There are also four bolts in the front of the oil pan that must be removed to free the timing cover. The oil pan was severely dented. It was going to be replaced along with the gasket and the oil pump. When I removed the oil pan, I got quite a surprise. The oil pickup tube had been removed and the oil pan was reinstalled. If you look carefully, you'll find the oil pump is not the old style that you may be used to. It's a low-profile crank-driven pump tucked away behind the timing chain and gears. If I had not discovered the missing tube, the engine would have run without lubrication and seized the motor almost immediately. The old engine became a donor from which I pulled the oil pan and the pickup tube. Before the timing chain and gears can be removed, the engine must be rotated until the number one piston is at top dead center on the compression stroke. I find it's easiest to find top dead center on the compression stroke using a compression tester. Install it in the number one cylinder and rotate the engine until the pressure increases to its peak. A piston travels up one side of the bore, reaches top dead center, and crosses over the bore and starts to travel down the other side. My goal was to determine when the piston reached the top center position of its stroke. I needed to know when the upward movement ceased and the downward movement began. To find this answer, I needed two special tools, a piston follower and a degree wheel. To fabricate the tool I needed, I used the probe from a mechanic's stethoscope, a broken spark plug, which I removed the core porcelain from, and a socket that fit the bore of the spark plug opening. The metal pin rested on the center of the piston, and as the engine was rotated, the pin would rise and fall in correlation with the piston travel. My piston follower worked very well. Now I needed a degree wheel so that I could determine the rotation of the crankshaft in degrees. 
I printed a four quadrant protractor scale from the internet. I adhered it with spray adhesive to a plastic disc. Next, I needed to create a pointer. People often use a bent coat hanger, but I wanted something a little more precise. So I suspended a needlepoint magnetic scribe from a bolt centered directly above the degree wheel. Then I rotated the degree wheel until it reached zero degrees top dead center and locked it in place with the crankshaft bolt. I rotated the crankshaft once again until the piston came up to top dead center and stopped. I repositioned the degree wheel to zero at this location. Then I rotated the crank until the piston began to move down. I counted the degrees from when the piston stopped moving initially till the piston started moving down and then divided this distance in half to determine exactly where the top dead center of the piston would be. I rotated the engine over one more time to top dead center and then brought it over the split difference so the piston was directly above top dead center and the slack was out of the system. Then I reset the degree wheel to be zero. With the cam shaft set at the proper timing position, disassembly could now begin. But I needed a way to secure the cam shafts from rotating once the timing chain was removed. This simple tool was about $85 and I was only going to use it once. I decided I would fabricate my own. In fact, I would fabricate two of them, one for each side. To form the clamp, I used a U-bolt with a rubber hose slipped over the bolt to protect the camshaft from the threads. To form the rotation lock, I used the strap from the other larger U-bolt and crossed it between the two carriage bolts. With both cams locked in position, it's time to remove the upper cam gears. Note, the left hand and right hand cam gears are different. The left hand has holes. A half inch extension placed through one of the holes in the left hand cam gear can be used to support the camshaft and prevent it from rotating as the nut is loosened. I used a C-clamp as a cam lock for loosening the right hand cam gear. So now you're wondering why did I need a cam lock to begin with? That holds the cam in place while the gears are being reassembled. I did not photograph the removal steps because I had the old engine as my template. With the cam gears removed, remove the four chain guides and the lower sprocket from the crankshaft. With the sprocket removed, it's time to remove and replace the oil pump. I coated the surfaces of the parts that I installed with Lucas Assembly Lube. All the hardware and the holes were pre-lubricated with Lennox tapping oil. It's a synthetic oil designed for cutting threads in a machine shop. It's my go-to for removing rusted fasteners. While reinstalling the timing chain guides and torquing the bolts to specifications, one of them snapped off. The bolt had broken beneath the surface and I was beginning to think I was going to have to drill the bolt out. Before resorting to that level, I decided I would try a scribe and I grabbed the ragged edge of the broken bolt and was able to rotate it. And soon I was able to turn it out of the hole far enough to grip the end with a pair of vice grips and remove it completely without removing the torqued guide. With the timing chain set installed, I cleaned the front cover and removed and replaced the front seal. If you don't own a seal driver, a large socket or a block of smooth wood could be placed over the seal and tapped squarely into position. Here's a before and after picture of the front cover and the harmonic balancer after being cleaned and painted. Note the water pump was also removed and will be replaced before putting the engine into service. To replace the rear seal, this aluminum cover must be removed. The factory service manual called for a special puller. I didn't have such a thing, so I removed the bolts. At each location, I placed a plastic composite shim, and then I tapped them in until they were tight. With all the shims tight, I tapped on the center of the crankshaft, and the cover popped free. I replaced the seal, lubricated the lip with assembly lube, and retorqued the cover. This aluminum shield was removed from the old engine, cleaned and polished, and installed on the new engine prior to installing the flywheel. The flywheel bolt pattern allows the flywheel to be installed in only one position. Rotate it carefully until all five holes line up and then begin to install the bolts. Because I work alone, I improvised a flywheel stop. I engaged a chisel into the tooth of the flywheel and rested it against an alignment pin. 
I didn't even need to hold it or clamp it as I torqued the flywheel to specification. To remove the rust from the ferrous parts, they were soaked in muriatic acid and then neutralized with water and then dried. The air conditioning line, however, was badly deteriorated and needed to be replaced. The oil pan from the old engine had some minor dents. A little massage with a plastic mallet and the dents were gone. Then it received a facelift with a can of gloss black paint. The parts got a fresh coat of paint and looked like new. With the engine upside down on the engine stand, a new gasket was installed and the bolts were torqued to specifications. Torque is applied from the center in a spiral fashion, working your way in larger and larger circles as you go. It's beginning to look a lot like an engine again. The motor had been removed from the car for several years, so when I began rebuilding the long block, I installed all of the accessories in a dry fit to make sure that nothing was missing. The photo on the right shows the starter solenoid will not clear the frame during the engine installation. The motor would not squeeze in. In the process, I damaged the solenoid and had to replace it. Before the intake manifold can be installed, two electrical sensors must be connected. The steel line that runs from the back of the water pump to the heater core must be removed to allow access to the knock sensor. It's shown in the picture with the red cap. The replacement intake manifold has an aluminum water passage that can take the heat without warping and leaking. All the engine accessories were dry fit prior to installation. I neglected to remove the throttle body prior to installing the motor. Here's a crystal ball moment. The throttle body must be removed before installing the engine. This metal vacuum line will not clear the firewall under any circumstances. The air conditioner was installed with the engine upside down to let gravity be the clamp. The engine wire harnesses were fully installed, the spark plugs were in place, the engine was ready for installation. Part 3 of this series will focus on the transmission. It will include a special conversion of the engine stand to allow the transmission to be mounted and rotated like a rotisserie. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned a few things along the way. Remember, subscribers are always welcome.